Hello and welcome again to New Road Baptist Church, where we hosted our Zoom service from the church this morning um, with some technical complications, but it all seemed to go uh, relatively smoothly in the end. And uh, we're working towards uh, having church services from, from here with a congregation, um, hopefully by the end of the month. Um, but obviously still uh, maintaining our, our Zoom service at, at the same time and trying to ensure that people are able to log in um, from home as well as join us safely in person. So um, in this video you'll, you'll find the, the sermon from the service that we had this morning and our readings were from Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 to 20 and Romans chapter 13 verses 8 to 14. Now I'm not really going to preach on Romans at all but um, if you like you could take it as the lens uh, through which to uh, enter into this kind of conflict resolution and, and transformation uh, that we find in the Gospel of Matthew. Now there are a number of different ways that people react when they are offended by another person. Some people react straight away. Their heart is always on their sleeves. The offence that has been caused will be known in no uncertain terms, immediately, vocally, and very publicly. Other people don't react immediately. They might stew on the wrongdoing and it breeds resentment, and they might share the offence with friends and family, holding on to bitterness and turning others against the one who has hurt them. Others hold it all in and try and move on like nothing has happened, perhaps thinking that the problem is not the offender, but themselves. And as more and more pain is bottled up over time, in the end, it all comes flowing out at once in destructive ways, probably after a pretty minor indiscretion that is the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. And nowadays, of course, there is another way to react to things that we don't agree with or things that offend us. I suppose in days gone by, a letter would have been written, but now you can plaster the offence all over social media. Name and shame those who've wronged you. Share with others across the world the hurt that has been done. It's so easy to write a hastily composed message in anger, to click send or post, and then sometimes instantly regret it. But by then, the damage has been done. Now you might recognize yourself or others in these caricatures, but what comes across in the Gospel of Matthew is an entirely different approach to conflict and disagreement. Here we find the one who has been hurt going to the one who has caused offence and speaking to them in private, trying to bring about reconciliation and restoration as the wrongdoer is given the opportunity to listen to their victim. And if there's no success in that conversation, then they're to come back with others from the church community, again to give the chance for there to be healing and reconciliation. But we hear that if the wrongdoer does not listen and change, then they are to be treated like a Gentile or a tax collector. Basically people who good Jewish people would normally avoid. Now, as we address these verses, I feel like first I should give a little disclaimer, and that's that although this model in Matthew offers something radically different to the way in which human beings normally react when they've been hurt by another, it does not give us a template to be slavishly followed. Because if you put it in place in every situation, then problems can easily abound. The one-to-one -one conversation could be dangerous in some ways in a context of coercive power and control. 
It also assumes that there is a clear-cut situation where the wrongdoer is 100% wrong and the offended one is entirely innocent. And we know from experience that life is often quite a lot more complicated than that. Yet, despite this disclaimer, there's much that we can learn from these verses as we encounter disagreement and conflict in so many different walks of life, in family life, in the workplace, or in the church community, in any place where human beings will share in relationships with each other. Conflicts, misunderstandings, and mistakes will happen. And reconciliation and restoration will therefore be necessary. In Matthew's Gospels, we Gospel, we have a helpful guide for how to deal with conflicts as disciples of Christ. And the first thing really is not to stew on the offence, but to go and talk about it as a priority, without publicly defaming and embarrassing the other, without gossiping behind their backs. And this is important as it can prevent small issues snowballing out of control. It can also make the offender aware of the results of their actions. Our offence is so often caused unintentionally. The perpetrator is unaware of the damage they've, they've caused, sometimes because of systemic injustice, or because of clumsiness, or even negligence. Until the other is aware of the consequences of their actions and the hurt that has come about as a result, then reconciliation and restoration in a relationship simply cannot take place. Now, this, of course, requires the offender to listen to the victim, to respect them. And in most cases, this listening has to happen both ways, as both need the opportunity to share their interpretation of events, to make clear their reasoning, to explain the background, maybe to the shortened temper, in order that the causes of the misunderstanding and prejudice or even blind stupidity are dealt with at root. Only then can new life be breathed into the relationship, forgiveness be offered and accepted, and both victim and offender can move on peacefully with a greater understanding of each other, and in turn a greater understanding of the love of God. Now this of course is the best case scenario where dialogue takes place, where people are prepared to change, prepared to listen, we must remember that this can be a painful experience. To listen to the way in which you've hurt somebody can be difficult. It can be frustrating, especially where there's been a misunderstanding. And sometimes we can react badly to such challenging conversations. Often things get a bit worse before they get better. But this is entirely necessary if reconciliation and forgiveness is to be found. Now, in a church setting, the purpose of such conversations and constructive dialogue that mends and strengthens relationship is to restore unity in the body of Christ, to bring the church together as one once more, sharing together in the forgiveness and love that Christ offers to us. Now, just before these verses, Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep where the shepherd goes out and looks for the one who's been led astray and returns them to the fold. And it's in light of this, really, that we should come to these verses. So they're not so much about church discipline as about redemption and restoration as the one who has made a mistake, who has been led astray in some way, is given every opportunity to return to the fold. Now, of course, sometimes... Despite the honest conversations and forgiveness offered and love poured out, it is the case that the offender will not listen and refuses to acknowledge the hurt that's been caused. And we heard already that the early listeners to the gospel are told to treat them as a Gentile or tax collector. In other words, to steer clear of them and have nothing to do with them. Yet, as we look at these words in the wider context of the gospel, 
we might stop and think for a moment about how Jesus treats tax collectors and the Gentiles. He breaks the norms and goes to those on the margins of society. Jesus dines with tax collectors. He calls a tax collector to be one of his disciples. He heals Gentiles as well as Jews. Jesus makes time for these people. He listens to their stories. He offers new life and the opportunity for repentance, reconciliation and forgiveness. The door is never closed to them. No matter how tempted we are to exclude those who don't see things the way that we do and to have nothing to do with them, to seek recompense or vengeance even, what we see in this biblical model of conflict resolution is quite, quite different. In that it reflects the way of Christ, the one who through the cross, his death and resurrection breaks the cycle of sin, violence and conflict, bringing love, forgiveness and peace that cannot be overcome. This is why we can say that when two or three gather in the name of Jesus, that he is present with them. Now, this is a verse that we often pull out of context to help us feel better when only a handful of people turn up to a prayer meeting or a Bible study. And it has its place uh, in that kind of situation, yet placed in the, its context within the Gospel of Matthew. We see that Christ is present in our attempts to mend broken relationships. He's present where we listen to each other's stories where forgiveness is offered and accepted, where we commit to change the way in which we behave in order that we stop causing pain to others. Christ is present in these difficult, challenging, but ultimately redemptive conversations and meetings. And this is true in community settings as well as in individual relationships. We've heard much this year about racial injustice and pain that has been caused to our black brothers and sisters, sometimes intentionally and at other times as a result of our inherited prejudiced society. And as we wrestle with this painful situation, as we listen to the stories of people of colour, as we seek after justice, change and restoration, then be assured that Christ is present with us. He's present with us wherever we work to bring restoration to lopsided and broken relationships. And not only that, he is within us and within the one who opens our eyes to the injustice and pain that they have experienced. Yes, there is no quick fix and we can find it hard to know what to do but Christ is with us and he will be with us tomorrow too and the next day as well in all situations where we share his love, where we offer or receive forgiveness, where we bring reconciliation, where we restore people to the body of Christ. And in all of these things, with Christ alongside us, we will further his kingdom in this time and in this place. Amen.